Hi everyone, um, thank you for the very kind introduction. My name is Sarah Fisher. I am a clinical neurology research fellow and one of the dispensing pharmacists for this trial. And Dr. Lindley is also here in the audience and she is our PI. So um, hopefully she'll help me answer some of these questions that I know you guys will have. Um, so we wanted to give a little update on the research that we have. It's not quite complete, um, very preliminary, but um, we're excited. I know you guys are excited. So we wanted to share kind of what we have with you so far. So just to start, I wanted to give a little bit of a reminder and background information just to make sure that everyone's on the same page before we kind of get into some of the preliminary data. So to start, we are a CDPHE funded study. We are a randomized control trial and double blind. We have two cohorts of subjects. The first one are our chronic back and neck pain patients, which I may refer to as our spine patient group. And then we also have a cohort of healthy controls. And the reason that we wanted to include these healthy controls is just due to the complex nature of um, doing research in these spine pain patients. A lot of them have comorbidities or maybe have developed a tolerance to opioid pain medications. Our study drugs that we have, we have the vaporized cannabis product, and this is in terms of the research literature medium dose. So um, we get it tested by NIDA every six months, and it's come back about 45 to 5.4% of THC. And we allow for a flexible dosing scheme. So when our patients come in, um, they have the option of four to eight puffs inhaling that many. And this is to allow the patients to self-titrate to achieve kind of the desired effect that they want while balancing some of those potential side effects that we are monitoring for. We also have our oxycodone immediate release capsules. This is either five milligrams or 10 milligrams. And this dosing depends on which cohort they're in, as well as how much long-acting opioid they are um, currently taking outside of this study. Um, we have our vaporized placebo cannabis, which was alluded to in the last study, and or the last talk, excuse me. And this is um, the plant material that has had the cannabinoids extracted via ethanol. And then lastly, our placebo cannabis our placebo oxycodone capsules, which looks identical to the active oxycodone capsules. Just to note, we do acquire our cannabis products from NIDA, um, since this is the only plant-based material that can be used legally for research purposes. So once our subjects pass the initial screening visit, they come in for three separate study visits. One study, they will get the vaporized cannabis product with a placebo capsule. One visit, they will get the placebo cannabis with an active oxycodone capsule. And then one visit, they will get two placebos. So just to make it very clear that um, patients are never getting the two actives in the same visit, it's either one or the other or neither. So for our primary study aims, we're really looking at the effect of our study drugs on kind of that relief of pain. So with our spine patients, looking at their relief of their chronic pain. And then in our healthy controls, we induce experimental pain um, during their study visit. And so we're kind of measuring um, the sensitivity to that experimental pain. So this picture is of our computer controlled pain algometer. And it was developed with some of our colleagues up here in Boulder. So we're really excited about that. Um, and so we opted to do the computerized version of this device versus the handheld one or the one that the study coordinator can use um, just to reduce that potential for human error. So how it works is it um, puts a stimulus on the muscle kind of right next to the shin bone and um, it um, induces pressure. And as you can see, this um, patient has a little um, device in their hand, which has a button on it. And so once that stimulus switches from pressure to a feeling of pain, then they press the button and we record what that pressure is. Moving on into some of our secondary study aims, um, we're kind of looking at uh, the global impression in their changes in pain. Um, as well as some subjective reports of the drug, so kind of how they're feeling after they take it, 
um, which we'll get into some of these um, in a few slides. We also do a, some neurocognitive functioning tests as well as a field sobriety test, and then of course always monitoring for those adverse events. Our enrollment to date, Rawa, our research coordinator who is also here, has done a lot of work to do a lot of pre-screening phone calls. She's done over 400, so that's amazing, thank you. <laughs> um, and then you can kind of see the trickle down of um, which, how many patients have passed that pre-screening phone call. We've had 49 patients come to that initial screening visit with 45 passing that initial screening visit. And then to date, we have, com we have completed 25 patients that have um, done all three study visits with some more kind of along that process. The other thing that I wanted to note on this slide is that we do have 13 withdrawals. However, those patients were patients that passed both the pre-screen and screening visits but decided not to move forward with the study visits so they didn't receive any of the study drugs. So just as one more note before I kind of show you the nuts and bolts of this, um, this is very preliminary data. Um, we're not powered for an interim analysis, but we did want to run some descriptive statistics for you to kind of show what we're starting to see. And this is just in those patients that have completed all three visits. So keep in mind that the healthy controls, we have 19 that have completed these visits, and with the spine patients, we have five. So kind of a small cohort to pull from, but we still wanted to show you guys anyways. And then also just one more note, um, Myself, Dr. Lindley, Rawal, we're all blinded. Um, so we're going to present the data to you today as treatments A, B, and C. And here we go. So the first graph that we wanted to share with you, this is our spine patient cohort, and this is looking at their pain scores. So on the left-hand side, you can see their uh, NRS scale for pain, which is the numeric rating for scale. So zero being no pain at all, 10 being the worst pain you can imagine. And then on the bottom, we ask them to do this rating for us, baseline, five minutes after administration, and then one, two, and three hours post-administration as well. As you can see, the treatments, um, treatment B kind of plateaus the whole time. Um, treatment C actually goes up a little bit and then comes back down, which is kind of interesting. And then um, treatment A, which is that red line, looks like it dips down um, and then comes back up closer to that three hours. So again, this is only five patients worth of data and it's um, kind of the average between all of them. So um, it will probably be more um, informational to look at between patient um, information and kind of see how they um, respond individually versus as an average, which we'll do that at the end once we have all of our data. Moving on into our healthy control subjects, so remember they're um, having that experimental pain and we're measuring that threshold. So we broke this out into males and females since um, it's been documented in the medical literature that um, there's a difference in pain threshold between the genders, so we wanted to reflect that here. Um, so on the left hand side we have the pain threshold. Um, of when the patients kind of hit that button of um, the stimulus switching from pressure to pain. And then along the bottom is again that, um, those time points during their visit. So the top, um, just to kind of give you an example, that green line, um, that kind of goes up. So the higher the number means that they're having less sensitivity to pain or a more analgesic effect from the study drug. So you know, at baseline, they could only tolerate the 60, and then three hours they could tolerate, it looks like at like 75. Um, and same with females, not as much of a difference. Um, again, these are just averages, and don't take into account that kind of between subject variability. Next, we kind of wanted to show you some of the subjective drug effects um, with our healthy controls. Um, and this is the 100 millimeter visual analog scale for each effect. We ask a series of questions. Here's one example. I feel any drug effect. And then this blue line represents a continuum with the left hand side, not at all. The right hand side saying extremely and the patients mark with a vertical black line um, where they feel they fall on this scale. And so um, when we measure these, we measure from the left hand side 
and we have a 100 millimeter um, ruler that we use, so it just kind of better quantifies um, this information. So this first one, um, I feel any drug effect at all. Um, again, just to orient you on the left-hand side, zero to 100 correlates to that blue line um, where they fall, zero being not at all, 100 being extremely. So you can see we have them broken out by drug A, drug B, and drug C. Um, it's interesting to see that drug A right away at five minutes kind of shoots up and then tapers off. Drug B is pretty low throughout. And then drug C isn't quite as high post-administration, goes up a little bit and then comes back down. The next question we have is, I feel a good drug effect. So the patient um, likes how they're feeling after drug administration. Um, again, with drug A kind of starting off at that 60 and then tapering down, drug B only really gets up to about 10 or so then comes back down, and then a similar um, effect is seen with drug C, still lower than drug A, um, only at about 25, goes up and then comes back down. This one is interesting, I feel high. <laughs> um, again, drug A really shoots up, it's up at the 70 and then tapers off. Um, drug C does similar again, um, not quite as high as drug A, but still some effect um, that goes up and then wears off. And then drug B is interesting. Um, I guess from this question alone, I'm blinded. I have no idea, so this is just my opinion, but I would venture to guess that drug B is placebo. Um, <laughs> but, but it is interesting that, you know, at five minutes, there's still feeling some effect, I guess, or they still mark that they're feeling some effect, so perhaps this is the patient trying to figure out if they are having an effect or not, um, but so it does diminish over time. This question, I feel impaired. Again, drug A five minutes after is up at about 40 and kind of tapers off, so less than those feelings of feeling high, um, but still more than drug B or drug C. Again, drug C at five minutes is a little bit, goes up a little bit, and then comes back down. And then this last one that we have is I feel sedated, which this is also interesting, we thought as well. Um, drug A and drug C both have effect starting at five minutes. However, they're a lot closer together than the other questions. So we thought that was interesting. They're kind of at that 20 to 30 mark um, and kind of just, you know, go along that doesn't drop off substantially like in the previous slides. And then again, drug B is just down at 10, maybe a little bit, but then tapers off. So in conclusion, again, just remember that this is very preliminary data. We don't have a whole lot of patients to draw from yet, um, so we can't draw those really robust conclusions. Um, but we did want to share some of our findings with you so far because we thought it was interesting and we're excited. We hope that you guys are excited as well. And then um, one last thing, we do need more participants. So um, if you know of anyone, especially those with any um, chronic back or neck pain, any patients that you think would be good for our study, we're more than happy to screen them for you. Here's our contact information at the bottom. And with that, we'll take any questions.